Hello, everyone. We are joined by Morgan Ortegas, formerly State Department spokesperson under the Trump administration. She also has a very, very long list of accomplishments, which I don't have to go in detail. They're very self-explanatory. And she was very gracious enough to speak with me about what prompted her to run for Congress in Tennessee's 5th District. So, Morgan, good to revisit with you. Thank you so much. It's good to see you again. What prompted you to run for Congress? Because you've largely been behind the scenes. You've been a fundraiser. You've worked on campaigns. You've worked a lot in communications. But what prompted you to throw your hat into the ring? Well, thank you so much for having me. Listen, I was really motivated to represent the people and the neighbors um, that I have here in Tennessee uh, because the economy, the border, our national security, I think are in the most perilous condition that I can remember um, in modern history. You know, we knew that the Biden administration would do a lot of things that we would disagree with. We knew Nancy Pelosi would do that as well. Um, and, and what I don't think that we anticipated is just how bad it could get so quickly. And so I'm used to, of course, raising my hand and getting in the fight. Uh, I did that by joining the military. I did that uh, by joining the Trump administration and working, as you know, as his State Department spokesperson for years. Um, and I love getting in the fight because I think that we are fighting for things that really matter to my friends and neighbors here in Tennessee. And like you said, I've never been a political candidate before, but um, I, I think with just how desperately bad things have gotten under Biden and under Nancy Pelosi, I thought, you know, I've got to be a part of the team that takes this back. Some people supporting some of your primary opponents have accused you of being insufficiently conservative and a so-called carpetbagger. How would you respond to those accusations? Yeah, I think uh, I earned President Trump's endorsement because he knows my conservative record um, and he knows my record of being able to fight for him. You know, I spent years representing the America First uh, foreign policy agenda of President Trump overseas. I did that to the world, traveled over 50 countries uh, talking to uh, everybody in, in the world about why President Trump was putting America first, why that was good for our foreign policy, not just good for Americans, but I think good for the world. Uh, whenever you see uh, the perilous conditions that we see in Russia and Ukraine, China, Iran, all of these things happen because we have weak and failed leadership. And I think what we need to do is take the House back. We need a Republican majority in Congress. And so I have a long uh, conservative voting record. I have a long record of serving my country. Um, and I think as President Trump uh, and many people who work for him would tell you uh, that I've always been a consistent fighter for him. I love Tennessee. Uh, we moved to Nashville to give my daughter a better life, um, to, give, to be in a place where you know, she can grow up next to people with conservative values. And I think a lot of people uh, have moved to Nashville also for that same reason, right? These are the things that America is founded on, uh, moving uh, to a place where your family can be free, uh, where your family can make the decisions that's best for them and not to be canceled by the woke mob for doing so. What are some of your key platform positions policy-wise? Could you elaborate briefly on where you're taking certain stands of where you fall in the policy line? Sure. There's so many things going on around the world right now. <laughs> um, so it's it's hard to narrow down just a few, but I'll give you the ones that I think are really top of mind. Uh, I think our border, obviously our Southern border is a huge and massive problem. Uh, this was um, something that President Trump inherited as a problem. And he instituted policies that that really stem the tide of illegal immigration coming into the United States. Um, these His policies were effective. They worked. And what does the Biden administration do? They come in, uh, they re they reduce, they change all of these policies, and now you're seeing just unabated illegal immigration. Um, and, and you're actually seeing the Biden administration have to bring back, they're trying to do it quietly, but they're trying to bring back uh, some of the policies that we put in in the Trump administration that worked at the border. They're putting them back in because they because they know they work. And listen, you you know, it's, it's, uh, you think if you think about it, you look at a map, you think, well, Tennessee is, is far from our southern border. Well, it's actually not. We're now a border state because the Biden administration uh, flies in illegal immigrants into our state. Um, and it's really, it, it's not only a domestic issue, I see it as a national security issue. Um, it's a national security issue uh, because, you know, this is the kind of thing, when I went around the world, that our southern border and how it's been just decimated, that's the kind of stuff you see in failed states. You're not supposed to see this amongst, uh, you know, one of the gracious, greatest nations that the world has ever seen, our nation, obviously. So that's really top of mind to me. I can tell you that economic 
economic issues are, are also very top of mind. I'm a pro-life conservative mom. And like many moms here in Middle Tennessee, uh, I go to the grocery store and you look around and a lot of times you can only find half of what you need for double the cost. And of course, I think about the people in our district, you know, the single parents or, or the people, uh, you know, who are who may not have the highest income at the moment. And, and they're having to uh, make choices of, uh, do I fill up the grocery cart entirely or do I fill up my gas tank in my car? We shouldn't have to make those decisions. We had a great economy under President Trump um, and it's time to get back to that. And of course, as you know, I have a long national security, security background. Um, I think the foreign policy that we pursued under President Trump was the best since Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan talked about peace through strength and President Trump really epitomized that. Um, and that's why we were able to see things like the Abraham Accords for peace deals between Israel and Arab states in 26 years. That didn't happen overnight. That happened to four years of President Trump putting in policies uh, where the world knew exactly where he stood. He was a strong president. We have weak and failed lead leadership that really endangers our national security. Um, and so, of course, as a mom, I'm very concerned about what I'm seeing around the country uh, in our schools, right? Kids in places not going to schools or kids being forced uh, to mask. I, I think what we've done to children, what the left has done to children in this country over the past two years, um, but especially under the last year under democratic uh, control, um, is, is quite scary, right? The CRT that's being taught in schools. Um, I think we need an army of moms, of conservative moms like me around the country that are going to stand up and fight and say enough is enough. And so that's why I'm raising my hand. Do you support policies to fund students instead of systems like school choice? I know that's a really big talking absolutely. point. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it is uh, unimaginable that parents, so many parents in this country are forced um, into a, a, a failing public school, a public school that cares more about unions than they care about the children, you know, a public school that's looking for uh, every excuse, you know, around the country uh, to keep schools closed. Um, and, and let me tell you who this hurts most. This hurts underprivileged children the most, right? Because they, their parents may feel like they don't have a choice. And that's what we need. We really need parents to give parents the ability to homeschool, to choose a, a religious school. Maybe the public charter school um, is the best option. Uh, whatever it is, parents need to know. I mean, I mean, I think as a new mom myself, the thing that you you know worry about obviously the most is their safety and security, but then you start thinking about their education right away. And what are they, what are their heads going to be filled with in school? And I think, you know, education starts in the home. It should be led by the parents and they should have the choice, um, not the government, about what their children are being taught. Similarly with unions, we start to see a really big push by big labor to unionize a lot of the private workforce. And actually of all the sectors of the economy that grew, self-employment was the only one to really not be super hard hit by the COVID pandemic. When you see mm -hmm. the Biden administration push to unionize everyone, whether it's through the PRO Act in Congress or regulatory fiat, I know Tennessee has a lot of independent contractors, self-employed people, gig workers, how are they responding to this big labor push to unionize everyone when most workers don't want to be unionized? No, I, I agree that people should have the choice. You shouldn't be automatically put into some sort of union. And listen, the gig economy is great for many people. Uh, you know, you have people like, listen, I worked my way through college and, and through graduate school. I put myself through school. I didn't get a penny from anybody. I did it through uh, waitressing and, you know, some odd in jobs, student loans, right? Just like everyone else. And, um, and so, you know, people need the sort of flexibility. There's so many more options now, even when I was putting myself through college. Uh, and I think people need that. People also want flexibility when they have small children at home. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that I think we should uh, incentivize. Listen, I've worked um, about half my life in government, half of my life in the private sector. I'm a big, big believer in private sector solutions. I think they're more efficient. Um, and I think that they give, uh, they're more efficient. And I think they give people ultimately more choices and more control of their life. Let's circle back to foreign policy. And when we first met, when I came to the State Department, I had asked Secretary Pompeo then Secretary Pompeo about Belarus and Russia. Now we start to see Ukraine being vulnerable to attack by Russia again. And I think what people fail to underscore is that we see a lot of actions taken by the Biden administration that allowed Russia to start to be more aggressive or continue to be aggressive with Ukraine. Do you think because of the actions the Biden administration took, uh, not enforcing Magnitsky, okaying the Nord Stream 2, 
Would you argue, or could it be argued that President Biden perhaps is Putin's puppet? <laughs> well, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, listen, the, the issue, we try to make foreign policy so complicated, right? And, and everyone calls himself an expert and analyst. <laughs> I've been working in this field for a long time. And, and I think it's very obvious that dictators are going to do what's in their own best interest, and they're going to do exactly what they can get away with. So uh, not a lot of this is surprising to me. Uh, Biden spent the first year, he and his team spent his first year sort of chasing Putin around the world trying to get him to negotiate. Uh, they, they caved right away on big things. And when you cave early on big things, like the, the stuff you talked about, uh, like Magnitsky, especially Nord Stream 2, um, when you cave on big things, then dictators see uh, that that you're willing to give an inch here, an inch there, and right? And, and then all of a sudden you're looking at a year later, you've given all these inches. A year later, uh, Russia has over 100,000 troops at Ukraine's border. Now, listen, I have said plenty of times that Ukraine is not a part of NATO. We should not be committing American troops uh, there. But but it's important to note that we saw so we're seeing so much hypocrisy. The same people who were lambasting Trump uh, during the administration, which I served, which by the way we were very touch, tough on Russia. Um, the same people who were lambasting us uh, are the people uh, that are in charge now. Those people were in charge during the Obama administration when Russia invaded Crimea, and then uh, and then fast forward, uh, you know what, six eight years later. Those people are in charge again with the Biden administration when it looks like Russia is at least attempting to invade or, or to get concessions um, out of Biden, out of NATO. Listen, I believe in a strong NATO. I think it's important, but America can't be the only one that believes in a strong NATO, right? This is why President Trump pushed Germany and other countries to pay their fair share. We can't want to protect Germany and France more than they want to protect themselves. Morgan, how do you plan to go to, while I have you still here, how are you planning to go about the district, familiarize yourself with the district. Are you going to implement what a lot of people are calling the Yunkin strategy, going everywhere across the district and communicating to voters of all stripes about a conservative agenda and how it can relate to them as well? Yeah, listen, we live in the greatest democracy uh, that the world has ever seen. And I love Nashville. I love Mid Middle Tennessee. Um, and I have so many friends and neighbors here who have just been so warm and welcoming. And for me, I think it is a, it's an honor. It's a privilege when someone says they're going to vote for you. I mean, that's one of the most humbling things that I've ever, that I've heard, right? Because that is so sacred. This is why I believe in election integrity. This is why I believe in voter ID, uh, because the right to vote is sacred. And so for me, it's important to reach and touch as many people in the fifth district of Tennessee as I can to have coffee with them, to sit next to them, to hear their needs and concerns for their children, for their grandchildren, for the future of this country. Um, so I never take a single vote for granted. And I'm absolutely going to get to every person in middle Tennessee that I can to tell them about why I think they should vote for me for Congress. And quickly plug in your social media yeah, links Thank and you. website. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's morganortegas.com and that's M-O-R-G-A-N-O-R-T-A-G-U-S.com. Perfect. Thank you, Morgan, for joining us and hopefully we can revisit again. I hope so. would love it. Thank you.